Hey, everybody. We're so excited that you are joining us today on this You Lead webinar. It has been a kind of crazy 24 hours, I know, for a lot of us. I know uh, some of you may be joining us and you have had lots of storms through the night. We know a lot of people that have internet down today. We're still trying to get one of our panelists connected, uh, ha having some internet struggles there. So um, we are just excited still to get to uh, be here with all of you. We'd love for you to let us know who's joining us. If you'll type your, your name and where you're from in the chat, um, we want to just see... Uh, see who else joining us. I'm seeing we've already got about 70 people on and here we go. I see all everybody coming through now. Yay. 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 That makes me happy that not everybody's without internet today. Um, but we're so excited to, to um, talk about uh, our topic today. And um, uh, just before we get started on just these practical things, um, how to lead and serve women uh, just to, uh, in this particular uh, webinar, um, I wanted to give you a couple of just a few quick announcements uh, to make sure um, you know about those. Um, we always do a giveaway every month and we are super, super excited because this month's given giveaway um, is for Lifeway Women Academy class. And it's for the class that is on how to lead and serve women. It's a practical ministry, 101, I can't even say it, 101. Um, it's taught by Jen Wilkin and Kelly King and Emily Dean and Lily Park. Um, and just, it's really, it's got the practical and the theological uh, foundation uh, for women's ministry. And um, just a couple of the questions that it covers in that is how do we care for our own souls as we lead? Uh, what do I do as a mentor? How do I handle conflict biblically? Where do I begin when I'm starting a women's ministry or a Bible study in my church? How to handle crisis situations? So this um, uh, academy, uh, Lifeway Women Academy course is a really practical, uh, helpful course. And so we're excited that we get to give away uh, that course. It's uh, typically $59 and it's 10 teaching sessions. So I make sure if you've not already signed up for the uh, monthly ministry to women newsletter that you sign up because that's where we draw the names from on that. Okay. So please go ahead and sign up for that. Um, I want to just remind you of a couple things. If you've never been on the webinar with us before, if you have any questions, we kind of take, have a Q and A time at the end. So if you go down at the bottom of your screen, screen where it says Q and A, if you'll be putting those questions in there, uh, Catherine will be monitoring the chat today, but it's really easier for us to gather those questions in that one spot and then uh, hit those near the end of the webinar. Cause hopefully we'll actually answer some of your questions along the way. So that's where we are on that. Um, and then um, I'm just going to, Let's let us start here in a minute. Um, but first, I want to introduce our panelists. I want to each introduce themselves to you and just tell you a little bit about who is on our panel today. So, uh, Rachel, let's start with you. Okay. Hey, girls. I'm so glad we all made it. Um, a little touchy for a bit, but um, I'm Rachel Loving Good. I am currently living in East Tennessee. So, was up all night watching the storms and. Um, uh, my husband, Jeff, is the senior associate pastor at our church, and I um, lead the women's ministry there, have a team of other people, and um, anyway, have been in ministry for about 36 years, gosh, a long time, obviously started when I was 12, and i um, kidding, got married when I was 20, and we've been in ministry that whole time, and every church I've been at have been able to either participate in the women's ministry or start it up if it needed it. So it's kind of been a fun ride in a lot of different positions from little bitty churches to great big churches to medium-sized churches. And I kind of have gotten to see that all along the way. I do a lot of ministry just on my own, going out, traveling and speaking at um, events and things. So again, get to see women everywhere. And it's just one of my favorite things to do. I love pouring into women who pour into women. Great. Okay. Tasha, introduce yourself. Hey guys, my name is Tasha Calvert and I'm the women's minister at Prestonwood Church, which is a multi-site church in the Dallas, Texas area. 
And um, I'm a life weight trainer. I'm a podcast host. I have a podcast called Digging In with Tasha Calvert, and I'm a Bible study author and um, just really passionate about seeing women connect in scripture. We have a mantra in our women's ministry, which is that Bible study is not a class you take. It's a rhythm you keep as a believer. And so I spend much of my days trying to equip women to uh, get comfortable in God's word. And just like Rachel, I go and speak and teach at different places and in different contexts and just so super thrilled to be with you guys today have you from all over really exciting yes yes we got I mean I'm looking West Virginia California Canada I mean this is so fun Dallas Boone um okay and then Dawn Stevens would you please uh, introduce yourself yeah I'm Dawn Stevens and I am women's minister at the church at Brook Hills in Birmingham I've been here 26 years this summer, uh, full-time women's minister, and I've had other roles, which happens in churches um, all on those 26 years. I currently am also overseeing special needs ministry. So from Birmingham, I lived here all my life and married and have a young adult son, and uh, I'm just glad to be with you ladies today. Hey, we've got an incredible uh, lineup of uh, panelists here today, and so excited to get to gain from their experience and just the things that they have learned along the way as we dive into our topic of what new ministry, women's ministry leaders need to know. Um, so some of you may be more experienced uh, women's ministry leaders, but things have changed through the years and uh, you may have been doing it and you're kind of like, oh, what am I doing? Or I need to go back to the foundational things, whatever. So I'm hoping there's something for everyone, no matter where you are, whether you're brand new or have a, have a little bit more of a seasoned experience. But we also today wanted to get to know you a little bit. And so what we want you to do is just you're going to use this one one of three words in the chat to describe best to describe your ministry and what you're what you're doing and so we either want you to say you're in an established ministry you're in a struggling ministry or you're in a brand new ministry so so new established or struggling and so we'd love for you to just type in those words you're doing it that's awesome because that just lets us know too we've got all across the board pretty here even. yeah this is so great this it's is pretty so even great. yes it really yeah. is yeah. Yeah. This yeah. Is, that's fun. This is really helpful. Yeah. Good, 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 good. Well, we're going to jump on into our questions with our panelists then. So, and I want the, on the first question, I want all of you to answer this. Um, and, um, but Dawn, I'll start with you. What is one thing you wish you knew when you started ministry that it took years to learn? Um, I think you still, I'm still learning it, but you've heard the phrase, how do you eat an elephant? It's one bite at a time. <laughs> and so when you come into women's ministry, I came as a volunteer, then paid part-time, then paid full-time. Mm -hmm. You want to do it all. You want to read all the books. I still haven't read every book on that shelf. Um, I have women review books for me. You want to do all the ideas. Um, you want to talk, you want to have coffee with all the women and you can't. And so what, are my strengths, what are my weaknesses, and how do I um, focus on where I'm strong and how do I bring alongside women that have the strengths I don't have that was given to me years ago, uh, leading your strength and staff in your weakness. Mm -hmm. So leading what you do well, bring along women that have gifts you don't have, empower okay. them, train them, equip them, and y'all all be, eat the elephant pretty slowly. That's great, Dawn. Okay, Rachel, how about you? What's one thing? You wish you I told I told Michelle before this that I, that this was a little bit of an issue for me because I kind of um, and I'll share something, but I, I do believe I've learned so much through the process that I don't know that I would have traded the mistakes. You know what I mean? Because I'm I'm just kind of that experiential learner. A lot of times in which I learn the best from where I mess up. But the 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 quickest thing I would say is this: something that my pastor and when we were at Long Hollow told us, and um, he taught it at a leadership thing but I thought it was so powerful. Never substitute public ministry for private devotion mm -hmm. and never substitute public ministry for private devotion. And I so resonated with that because the more that you lead, the easier it is to fall into this, this um, manner of living in which I study the word to teach it to somebody, or I hear a sermon and think that's person, Oh, I know who I need to share that with. 
and and it was it was something that I, I still struggle with to this day is I love to share with somebody an empowering word from the Lord. But what God convicted me of years ago with that statement that David made was this concept that every time God's word is opened in my presence, whether I'm opening it or someone is teaching it to me or I'm listening to Tasha's podcast or whatever, it's always for me first. Like I need to always pause and and say, Lord, what do I need to learn from this? Like, how do you want me to change? Because his word is living and active and it is designed to transform us and change us. And so it's always for me first. And here's the thing, when you feel like you're teaching or leading and you, you're kind of powerless or ineffective feeling, um, a lot of times it's because of this very topic. Um, because I, you and I will lead most effectively about that which we are most passionate and we are most passionate about that which we've experienced or learned. Does that mm-hmm. make sense? So mm-hmm. always taking God's word for myself and, and letting it apply to my life. And then I'll go out and I'll teach it more passionately. It will have more power um, in the delivery. So that's that's probably where I would I would land with my biggest. A great word because you, you're the best teaching comes out of the overflow of what God's already doing yeah. in your life. Tasha, how about you? Well, that was really good. I don't know if I can top that, Rachel, but I will say, um, I think I have tried to embrace the spirit of Elsa, which is let it go. Um, There are many (laughs) days that you have to let your to-do list go in favor of sitting with a woman who's in crisis or somebody that has come in and needs something. So people are always going to trump those types of things. So you have to hold your your to-do list uh, loosely. Um, you've, I've had to let go of some of the goals and expectations that in my flesh, I would love to have for an event, a certain number that we reach or a certain outcome or response that I'm really hoping that I get in favor of the fact that God may have had us put on a whole event for one or two people that really needed that in their life. Um, I've had to let go of certain programs that I would really love to, um, to implement in the ministry in favor of being in a larger ministry context and understanding that's not going to fit into our church calendar. So um, letting go of even my personal aspirations and, you know, I'm, I'm very driven. So those types of things in favor of making much about Jesus. So I just uh, letting it go, holding it loosely, I think has been really key for me in uh, developing a ministry pattern through the years. All three are just phenomenal suggestions to, to go back to the basics and go, if I'm starting out and actually, if I'm into it 20 years or 40 years, those are things that you just need to be back at your foundation with. Okay. So Tasha, you, you were just talking, so I'm gonna go ahead and pitch this back to you. Okay. So, So how do you take inventory of, of where you're serving the women that, uh, you know, what's going on with the women? Um, How do you identify really where you're serving and how to best meet their needs, I guess, is the question. Okay, so I'm going to answer this kind of two part. For one, I would say if you, there's a lot of you, in fact, I'm looking over in the chat, a lot of new, it is fairly equal. But for, for those of you who are kind of new into this, if possible, and I know it's not always possible, but if possible, it would be the gold standard to go an entire year in your ministry without making big changes. And there's a few reasons for this. One of them is that you want to take that time to build relational collateral with the people. And you also want to see what's going well. So I think, you know, because we don't have like huge metrics, obviously you can you can determine what has been successful as far as like time of year for an event or something like that. But as in the day-to-day ministry operation, I don't think you know what's going well and what's not going well until you have really observed it up close and you want to, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So there may be some things that need an a uh, facelift, so to speak, but there's some things that really resonate with your people. So observe those things for a year before you make big changes. And then when you do make changes, you've built some relational collateral with your women so that they trust you when you have to go in and maybe tweak some things and change some things. But I think also, and I think we're going to talk about this a little bit later on, knowing what your wins are. Sometimes if you're in an established 
women's ministry, you may say this has been something that's been very successful. We've got the same number of people here, but it's not resonating in the same ways. And so I think just being able to take a step back and kind of look at things from a 30,000 foot view and um, understand what your wins are, determine what you're looking for. If you're numbers driven and you have found something that gets 500 women there all the time, well, then obviously you are hitting your mark. But if you're looking for spiritual maturity or leadership development, then getting 500 women in a room that are going to walk away and not necessarily sign up to serve or be on your leadership team is not the win. So you, in, in the more established, Established ministries, I think you need to really uh, hone in on what your win is and then take it up a level and look at what's going on in the bigger picture. That's Those are two good places to start. That's great. Uh, Rachel or Dawn, do either one of y'all have anything you want to add to that at all? Um, I will throw this in there. I agree with Tasha. I think that's all brilliant. Sometimes though, I think if what happens to this woman who comes in and she's supposed to start and there's nothing going on. So that's a little different. Here's what I would say in that situation. And I think it's really cool. Um, anytime you have to start a brand new ministry kind of from scratch, or maybe it got killed a year ago and you know, whatever, or it had to, it died a slow death and whatever. Anyway, you're, you're coming in there and kind of on a blank slate. There's a, there's a concept that Jeff and I've done whenever we go to new churches to kind of figure out what needs to happen. It's called prayer and listening sessions. And I would say they don't even have to be super formal. Um, you could invite just a bunch of, of women to, to brunch or lunch. You could have a get together at the church. Go wherever groups of women are at your church. So if there's a women's class already, like a Sunday morning class or whatever, and say, hey, can I just ask you these five questions or whatever, kind of come up with some, like some easy to answer parameters of where, where do you think the women are right now? Where are you personally? What do you need? What do you think women in our community are struggling with or dealing with? And what do you think would appeal to them, would cause them to want to be involved? Those kind of questions, and you can kind of come up with them, but ask those same questions and then invite everybody to pray with you for what needs to be going on forward so that as you're making choices, and I would say and taking Tasha's advice into application in, in a brand new setting would be move slowly, move slowly. And, and don't try to, like Dawn said earlier, don't try to do everything at once, but prayer and listening where you're inviting women to join you in praying that God will develop what he wants to develop. And then to give, and then that will help give you the wisdom to know, well, let's start with this thing. And then let's start with this. And then every woman that you've heard from or that you've prayed with, um, they're going to be your biggest supporters because they're going to be like, she cares about what we think. So it's so good. So good. So how do you create a ministry focus or, or how do you know what your ministry's focus is? Um, what does really, what determines what you do and what you don't do? Tasha, you, you kind of said, you know, 500, and it's, it's big, it's a big group, but there's not a lot of depth there. So how do you determine, um, you know, what is going to be the focus there? I think the fact that you're asking the question is always the good place to start because what, what will happen in women's ministry inevitably is if you are not proactively asking that question, you will have a hundred women that have an idea of what should be or five women or whatever the context of your, you, you can tell I come from a larger, a larger church, but you know, whatever your context, women have ideas of what they want the women's ministry to look like, and you're not going to find consensus. And so as the, the designated leader or the person that who has stepped up to serve, you want to ask that question. And I think you want to also make sure that you have asked the people in authority over your ministry that question as well, because it may be that they have an expectation for your ministry. I know that when I went into this role, as they call me the global women's minister, I had been leading at one of the campuses. When I went into that, you know, overall ministry, our pastor sat down with me and he said, here's the deal. I don't want a bunch of social things on the calendar. I don't want um, a bunch of, you know, different activities and conferences. Those are fine every once in a while. I want our women to learn the Bible. And so our mantra became what I shared with you, that Bible study is in a class. It's a rhythm you keep as a believer. So then that helps me when somebody comes to me and says, you know, what about us doing 
some big initiative that is really not going to be helping connect women in the word or with their um with their life groups or things like that, that we've identified as our primary ministry. So it can be like, that's a great idea. I don't know that that falls under the scope of what we as the women's ministry are primarily trying to do. And so I think it just helps give you some focus to ask the question and then come up with some type of theme, mantra, mission statement that falls underneath, and this is always the key, that falls underneath the mission of your church. Mm -hmm. um, because if it's too far outside of what the goals of your your parent program is, it's not going to be successful. And, and further, it may end up being at odds and cause problems within the body of Christ. And we're called to unity. So we need to make sure that we keep our context aligned with, with our church polity. That's so good, Tasha. And I think you brought up a good point, you know, your pastor or, you know, other, other leadership in the church spoke into what the focus was going to be with the women's ministry. So it does all stay under the whole umbrella of the church. Dawn, you have taught so many times on women working with men for some, uh, women's ministry leaders, whether they are in a paid position or volunteer, it may be, a. a well, whether it's new or old, whether you're a brand newbie at working with men or you've been doing it for how many years, sometimes it's challenging because we often think differently. But what um, when you just um, think about the years and, and what you've learned, but how how do you help women um, work with the men in their church, on the church staff or whoever they're um, is their supervisor, if they're a volunteer, who are they reporting to on the church staff? Um, what are some good tips that you would give Dawn? Yeah, and I'll jump off what Tasha said. So working with, usually it's a pastor, um, uh, working under their oversight and working with them uh, because you're brothers and sisters in Christ first. So mm -hmm. keep that in mind as your foundation. And if you're not sure who that person is, find out. Who do I report to? Who gives oversight to women's ministry? And just ask to meet with him. And um, share, you know, your heart, share your excitement, your passion. Um, like Tasha said, here's a couple of things that we think are important. Uh, not a list of 10, but a couple of priorities that we think are important. Uh, we would like to have your guidance on, your, uh, your help with, to make this happen for the women. And so you've got to find out who that person is and establish your relationship as a brother and sister in Christ, mutually respectful um, and working together. And usually it's a discipleship pastor in some churches, education pastor. It might be senior pastor, associate pastor, whoever. Just building a relationship is a big part of it. Um, and then learning how he communicates, um, learning his rhythm and style of working. Um, does he like appointment meetings? Do he rather just sit um, in an open area and have coffee. Um, just learning about him. We have a whole webinar we did, I think, April of 2021. Maybe we can send that link or we can put that in the chat. It's a whole webinar working with men in ministry. There's some resources uh, that we're going to give you that I shared also um, There's that are real good help out there. But I would say seeing him as a brother in Christ, having a team approach, um, and learning each other, respecting each other, and communication is very important. Um, and you know, it's an evolving relationship like anyone that's in your life, um, being real clear in your focus, in your direction and, um, how you want to serve the women of the church that he's been called to lead. Great. Great. That's so good, Dawn. Um, I want to kind of shift gears here. One, um, in some Lifeway research, one of the things that came out, um, in the last, uh, couple of years was the struggle, uh, to get volunteers. Um, in in any capacity in the church, COVID kind of, you know, sent people home for a while, shut things down for a bit, um, and people, you know, some people are hesitant to come back, but the whole structure of a lot of churches changed during that time. But um, I guess I have a couple different questions related to, but how do you get, how do you get women on board in general? Um, but um, but volunteers and people to help with the women's ministry. How do you, um, you know, really pull them in? Rachel, you want to start for us? 
Sure. We have a great, we, we have more volunteers than we need a lot of times. So I have to kind of be creative because I don't want people to, to come to volunteer and not have something to do. Um, we honestly, we use incentives. I, I, I say, hey, we, we would love to have you volunteer with us. And when you do, you get first dibs on this or you get to, you know, you get to get your size of T-shirt, for, you know, or whatever. But just kind of have some incentives. And and there's even a, a strategy, I won't share the whole thing, that I that I do for events because that's usually where you need the most volunteers um, is that I do that whole, this whole thing of enlisting people to sell the tickets and then have a launch party before the event and bring in the volunteers and pray with the volunteer, have the volunteers cast a vision of what the room could look like full, we'll have them pray and then have them volunteer. And then they feel like this sense of responsibility. And, um, and then what happens is when volunteers come, we love on them hard and we thank them. And we, like I said, we do whatever we said we were going to do. And then they feel needed. And then they thanked me for the opportunity to volunteer. And then they're the first ones to, to, to volunteer the next time. And so I think um, helping them see the vision of why they matter. Um, Passion City probably does it as good as anybody um, with their door holder concept. It's people who stand and hold a door. My goodness, they're greeters. But they carry on about them in a good way. I don't mean that in a negative way, but they, they carry on about them so much that it feels like a special thing to do, which it is a special thing to do. Um, and so you want to love on your volunteers enough. Um, and that includes, you know, the way that you might um, encourage them when they don't have the right attitude. You know, I've got a couple of volunteers that I've, I've had work with us before and I'm thinking, heavens to Betsy, I think they missed our mission here, Tasha. I think they're trying to get people to leave instead of come, you know? And so I have to say, hey, you know, maybe this isn't the best place for you. Let me get you to work over here with nothing, you know, uh, with no people or something. But, um, but finding ways to help people learn what's the best way to volunteer, but then making them feel needed is, is huge. People want to be connected and they want to be a part of something that matters. When they see it matters, they'll do it. So just kind of helping that. So good. Anybody else want to add to that? I, I did think of one church that I had uh, visited at one point and they actually had a, 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 women, a woman or two that their place of greeting, they stayed outside the women's restroom and talked to every person that came out. They didn't stalk you and follow you in, but they, um, because they, they said a lot of women that are, if they come to church by themselves or they feel uncomfortable, they'll take a break and go in the restroom for a minute and kind of just like gather their courage to go back out. And they said, we were able to meet more people that way. Some women oh, okay. who, who, yeah. Isn't that a fun idea? I was like, I never would have thought yeah. of having a bathroom greeter that they wouldn't say anything when you're on your way in, but when you were coming out, you know, uh, and yeah. would just in, engage in some conversations, um, especially a visitor, you know, that's coming in and they're not even, sure where to go or and they tried to identify those people but I thought that was well we are seeing so many visitors coming and we have a women's event and so we coach our people that when you see someone walking in and obviously alone say hey are you meeting some friends or are you new here can I introduce you to somebody you know like that and we have met really good connections that way but I like the bathroom idea that's kind of fun okay Okay, well I'm gonna gonna, go ahead one little word there we try to use the word guest instead of visitor because guests kind of connotates you're coming into our home you're coming into our environment well, you've invited someone usually invites them mm -hmm. so visitor is you're kind of a stranger maybe not I don't know but mm -hmm. that's just a little help with language that we try to say we're glad you're our guest today welcome to our guest and it just has a little a warm feel so just that's a good that's a great tip that's a really great tip um kind of talking about volunteers because they are volunteers, you know, they are volunteers. What, what expectations can you, you know, where do you, um, where do you set the boundaries? Where do you, um, you know, somebody's wanting to volunteer for a whole lot or someone else, you know, that actually their level of volunteerism is really stressing them out. They've, they've overcommitted, but how do you help women avoid burnout? Um, and just, um, but to stay engaged in things, how, how do you, um, how do you help them with those volunteers? And then I actually want to change that and, and have you also answer if you are the volunteer, 83% of women's ministers are volunteers. 
So if you're the volunteer, how do you also set the boundaries? So the women who are serving and then yourself, especially if you're a volunteer. What are expectations and boundaries? Okay, I have, I, I, can I answer it kind of from both perspectives? Yes, please. I think when you've got, um, and this is just kind of a ministry thing that came to me when you were describing that, because I found myself listening to you ask that question, Michelle, and somebody, w- one of our volunteers was popping into my head. And I think the reason why she popped into my head is because she volunteers for everything we do because there is so much going on in her personal life. And we are honestly a, um, an escape for her. We, we are a safe place for her. She is surrounded by people who love on her and who, um, minister to her and pray for her. Whereas when she goes home and into every other situation, that is not what she finds. And so I would just say, keep your eye out when you do have women like that, that are just seem to be pouring their heart, body, and soul into it. You know, they may be called, they may, that, that may be the Lord's hand on their life. It could also be indicative of something that's going on. And that might be a really great ministry opportunity. So don't forget to minister to your volunteers. That's one thing I would say in that situation, as far as the unpaid, um, the unpaid volunteer who is maybe serving in more of a leadership capacity. I think communication is key on that. If you are, um, if you are volunteering in the women's ministry position, hoping that the church leadership is going to see how valuable you are to the ministry and they are going to see how much you're doing and offer you a job. I would caution you against that. I would, I would say that communication needs to be very clear and very upfront, especially because most of us are going to be dealing with men that will be in those decision-making roles and men are, are pretty cut and dry as far as their communication style. So I would say Find out, be be upfront about what you are willing to give and make sure that what you're willing to give matches what your capacity, what, what your God-given capacity is. Because if you have also been given small children at this season in your life, and you also have a part-time job that you have to do, or you're tutoring or homeschooling or whatever else, you know, make sure that you are communicating your boundaries that that match your life stage and what your expectations are. And then ask for, for that also to be communicated back to you. You know, if somebody asks you to take on a role, it is not unloving to say, I am willing to consider that role. What is your expectation for it? I think that's a good principle, even if some of you are, are transitioning from volunteer to paid staff or or anything like that. I think, I think, you know, clarity is kindness. We hear that go around with the dating thing, but I think it's such a good principle um, in the, in the church as well to just be upfront. I think it solves being upfront about what our boundaries are, what our limits are, what our capacities are, what our willingness, you know, some of it's, it's like, yeah, I might could give more, but I'm not willing to give more at this point because I, I need to be using that time to earn some money. It's okay. Even if your church can't afford to pay you, it's okay to look at your life stage and say, I actually need to be contributing financially to my, to my family at this point. And so I can only give this much because it's going to require that I go and actually earn some money. Uh, is any, anybody else want to hop in on that Well, and You were going to say something. What were you going to say? Um, because I started the volunteer, then went part-time, then went full-time. <laughs> um, you may have to take the initiative in what are my expectations? What's my job description? And you may have to write your own job description, which is fine. I think we put in the chat, there's a free ebook, uh, ministry to women. Yeah. And in there are some sample job descriptions. So if you don't have a job description, you look at that and create one and, and have agreement with your supervisor. This is my number of hours. This is what my require, my role is. Now that's going to change over time, but just be real clear. They know, and you know, the expectation, and that usually helps, you know, prevent some misunderstandings. Good. Let, right let me address the boundaries for volunteer leader. Cause that's what I am. I'm actually a voluntold leader, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> Same concept. A um, couple of things. One, I already shared that one before. 
um, about public ministry and private devotion. So keep your focus on the Lord. Number two, recognize, um, I firmly believe it's a privilege to serve on the front lines of ministry. And um, and so when, when I keep that in the, the front of my mind, um, that God doesn't just allow and call everybody to do these kind of things, um, it, but it's focused on as a privilege. But here's the other thing is you can wear yourself out. So get other people to do a whole lot of what you need done. Um, so in other words, develop a leadership team and get, get a team of girls, of women around you who, who represent the women that you're trying to reach. And if people say, oh, whenever we do anything, we only have, you know, the 40s and 50s there. When we do anything, we only have the 20s there. Well, I would say, how old are you? Because you will replicate yourself in who's coming to your events or your whatever programming, whatever it is that you're planning. And so develop a leadership team around you that represents all of the women that you're trying to reach, not just the women who are already going to your church, but let's think outside the walls, girls. And there's a lot of women out there that we can bring in. The number of women that I talk to at my church who say, I came because of this one women's event y'all had. I came because of a women's Bible study. I came and then I brought my husband and I brought my kids and we brought our whole family. So women's ministry, ministry to women, it's a huge wide open door. So get you a leadership team of women that are that are connected in each of those different kind of demographics, working women, single women, um, married women with kids, empty nesters, grandmamas, um, no kids, you know, all of these kind of things, stay home moms, get the wide range. And that way you, they're all represented. So when you plan things, it's going to take into account you know, the specialties of each of those demographics so good. and give them delegate. It's a word called delegate, delegate, <laughs> delegate, big word, big word that we all need to know better, probably in lots of places in our lives. Right. Okay. So I want all of you to answer this. Um, what are some tips or tricks um, as you've been in leadership roles, various leadership roles and with ministry that has really, um, helped you just really care for your own spiritual growth because we've continued to come back to so what are things that are like regular rhythms for you ties those for just your own spiritual growth dawn you want to start um i would say it may sound simple but setting a time and a place for you to have your time alone with the lord Mine's either in the office in a chair in the winter or now I'm on the porch now that it's already 87 degrees in Birmingham. Um, and so with my little basket and my coffee or whatever, and, um, you know, I'm a real, I like structure. I like organization. And, you know, the, within this certain time frame, um, because if you're working full time, you have children, you're a working mom part time, or you may be working vocationally and volunteering in the church. You know, our time is our most precious commodity. So just set time for you. You're important. And you have to have that time and that place and create your space that's comfortable for you. It might be a desk. It might be a chair. Um, but just have your place that has your stuff because you're going to bring reading home. You're going to bring, sometimes you bring work home. I just think a time and a space for you to be with Jesus is important. Good. Yeah. Good. Tasha, Rachel, y'all want to add anything? Sure. Mm -hmm. oh, go ahead, Tasha. You go next. Okay. I'll go real quick. I am <clears throat> a um, auditory learner. I listen to a thousand different podcasts. So I, re I am up and down the tollway. You know, again, this, a lot of this is probably contextual to me, but I am in the car a lot. So I listen to a lot of very spiritually formative podcasts and audio books. I mean, so I'm, I'm trying to constantly flood in. I listen to the Bible every morning audibly. Um, I just, it, you know, I go back, I, I read along if I'm where I can, I read along in my scriptures and highlight and make notes, but I, I am constantly redeeming my time, my passive time, uh, by, uh, just allowing, you know, God's word to seep into me. And that has been something that has worked super, super well. But then I also need the accountability. I mean, I will 
nobody's asking me to do this. Tara Lee is certainly not, but the Bible recap has been really awesome yeah. for me to just have something, a, a place marker every morning that's quick and easy. Obviously that's not where I'm getting completely spiritually formed because it's pretty quick, but I think being in reading plans and always having something to keep that rhythm rather than it just always being a class that you do is a, not surprisingly my, uh, my big piece of advice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love those. I love those. So a conversation that my husband and I had a couple months ago um, that I think really applies here was this concept of there's so much about ministry that can be extremely draining. And yet there are also things that we do in ministry that just they it's the concept of they drain us and they fill us up at the same time. And to me, I'm going to describe it as when I'm serving in my strike zone when I'm getting to minister in, in my, just my super giftedness area or something, it's like it, it, I'm a little scared because I'm teaching God's word. So I'm always a little nervous to rightly represent it, but, and it drains me, but then I also feel so fulfilled. So ask yourself this, what are the things that make me feel the most fulfilled, passionate, excited about ministry? Identify exactly what they are. Is it the details behind the scene? I don't understand you if it is. You go, girl. But if it is, know that it's doing the details. If it's leading, that facilitating the Bible study, know, you know, know, identify what that is. And Jeff and I were talking about it. And we both sat there and thought, you know, look how much different we feel when we're getting to do those exact things. And it doesn't mean that you don't do the other things because they may be part of your job description or they may be part of this. But then be super intentional about always um developing more of those opportunities, taking super advantage of those opportunities because they're going to allow you to serve in your giftedness and your strike zone and, and you feel fulfilled even more um, in that. So that's that's one way. And the other way I would say is this, um, don't stop challenging. So I, I love the Bible recap. Um, I also just started doing, um, and I'm in love with this book. It's called Rediscovering Israel by Christy McClellan. And she literally walks through the whole Bible, like in this narrative. And it is unbelievable how she's tying pieces together. So it's, but it's challenging me to look at scripture differently. So here's the deal. Whenever I'm dry or whenever I'm reading something, like maybe I'm reading this plan and I just like, I get through with it and I'm like, oh gosh, I don't even know what that was. Or I don't even remember what it said, or that didn't do anything for me. Whenever you're dry or you feel like God's word is not speaking to you, you're the problem or I'm the problem. Okay. It's not God's word. His word is always living and active, but when it's not speaking to me, it means I'm the problem. So do it differently. So, so I was kind of, uh, you know, kind of started looking at rediscovering Israel and letting that kind of direct some of the studies I'm doing. And then on this side note, I got real interested in this whole concept. Do I really know the Holy spirit and how all these different names for the Holy spirit. And so I'm in that. And so always just kind of looking for some different things to kind of dig into a little deeper, um, you know, like Tasha was even talking about earlier, but digging in a little deeper on some things. Maybe I'll teach on that. Maybe I won't. But the deal is this. Remember, it's not about what can I do out there, but it's what does God want to do in here? And so those are two of the biggest things is figuring out where where your strike zone is in ministry. And then always kind of looking for some deeper things. Go out on Dawn's porch. I'll give you her address. And you can go on Dawn's porch and, and study something a little extra. You know, dig into something that's really meaningful to you and just see what if it doesn't kind of stir up your passion for the Lord and kind of keep you um, in, in a good place. And I had one more thought. Um, I also realized, we also realized Tush and I own staff at large churches, um, but we realize a lot of your volunteers and finances can be a constraint. Even if you're on staff at a church, we have so much money we can spend and we don't spend over that. There's so many free resources like this webinar. So schedule your personal development time. I'm very passionate about women's personal development on your calendar and re-listen to this a webinar or the other 50 out there that we've done yeah. over the past five years on topics um, that are important to you. You know, I'm jumping on two free trainings in, in the coming couple of months. There's so much free resources out there, but put it on your calendar. You're worth it. It's important to you as a leader um, to schedule, you know, personal development, but there's lots of very affordable uh, resources out there. Look for those. That's good. Yep. 
I think there's more than ever since COVID with all the things that had to go online. Dawn, you've always been so passionate about that in developing your own uh, leadership, but then also really encouraging those in your church to do that. And I, and I've loved that you've told people that over and over again, make sure, you know, somehow figure out if they will let you budget one conference to go to a year or whatever. I'm going to, I'm going to jump to a couple of the uh, questions that are in the uh, Q and a, because we've had a few come in that I think are really good that I think we want to address. One is at what point do you ask the question about numbers versus depth. Um, so talking about, I guess, the number of women who are attending versus are they a lot of them, but they're very shallow and and maybe not really even living out their faith like you would hope. And then versus helping women to really go deeper and really walk out, uh, you know, walking in the way of Christ. Um, somebody want to tackle that one? Okay, I'll tackle that. Um, when I first came into this ministry, we had a standing conference on the um, calendar. And again, I'm from a large church. So the the year that I came in and got to be over everything, we had Lisa Turkhurst and she's awesome. And I love Lisa. And we got over 2000 women in the room easily. But here's what I noticed. We didn't have anywhere near 2,000 women two weeks later when we started Bible study. (laughs) So we got 2,000 women in the room um, and they had a really great night, but it was not necessarily impacting the, the ongoing discipleship program or the connection with our church body. Um, and so I, rem- I, I began to rethink what we wanted to do. So the next time when we had a big person, we made sure that we had more of our leaders up on the stage with her to, you know, with the person that we brought in to be able to, to start to equate that, like, this is not something that we only come to when the big name is here. There is actually some ministry leaders that are here at this church for the ongoing ministry and discipleship with you. And so I think you can look at numbers in that way versus engagement to kind of gauge whether you're going to do that. And then I think you can look at it more granularly, that's a hard word to say, but, you know, more on a micro level and see if, um, you know, like, are you noticing, like, I also have noticed from time to time that we had lots of women that sit in Bible study, but I would call up some of those women who had been there 10 years and say, Hey, I've got somebody that needs to be discipled or mentored. And they would say, well, I don't feel, I don't feel qualified to do that. And so we had to start looking at, well, how are we assessing the wins there? Like, are we not presenting the right material? Are these people that have been in book studies rather than actually studying their Bible and and being spiritually formed by that? And so I think you kind of have to have a holistic look. And and that's kind of goes back to that question we were talking about at the beginning of looking at your ministry, you know, like an overview of it and then honing in on where are your wins? What are the women saying? How, where are you struggling to, to mobilize women? And what's the root issue of that? I'd say one more thing. Um, Men tend to think in numbers. Sometimes that's how they're wired. They're not all that way. So it is important to, to keep good numbers because when you're asking for budget money or you're asking for, we want to do this initiative, um, you know, we had 10 new women came and those three new families into the church because of women's ministry. So uh, numbers are helpful um, to gauge growth. They're not the end goal, you know, but they're helpful. And so it's good for good, just to keep good record keeping. And you may eventually ask, be asked for quarterly reports, or I have to send a report for the elders every month, which is more of a story of what God's doing in women's ministry. But I list, you know, 10 new women uh, came to summer study and uh, that's, you know, two new families have now joined the church. So uh, it's helpful to think that way. And you may not think that way. Well, find someone on your team that thinks that way and let her be the numbers gal that helps keep you, you know, give you some, a picture of what's happening in women's ministry because numbers tell stories. And so if you can put the person behind the number, um, you kind of tie the two together. I think that's helpful. Yeah. And John said the great sentence, don't miss it. 
every number is a person. Don't ever stop counting numbers because numbers are people. And the reason why people stay shallow in their faith is because they don't know how to do it differently. And Mm -hmm. so when we have a big event and we get all these people there, are they walking out? Okay. And you know what, for your church, that might be a hundred women and your church may not hold what Tasha's holds. That's okay. Same concept. Everything is very relatable to your sizes. But let's say that you had something and it was the this person that everybody knows in your community and she's going to speak. And so a hundred women come, make sure that when they walk out the door, they've got, you've got their information. So you can follow up, follow up and take home application should always be something that we talk about application. People do not know how to apply God's word to their life automatically. It's a lost art. We need to self feed them. We need to hand feed them until they begin to learn it for themselves. It's biblical. It's biblical. And so when they leave, or what are we doing to follow up on this concept that we introduced at this event that they came to? 75 women were there, 100 women were there, um, but yet none of them are coming back to Bible study. That's because they haven't made that connection. So we want to do something where we're where we're feeding it to them, get, putting something in their hands. Y'all, all of that stuff can be free too. Mm-hmm. I, I develop most of the things that we do as take-homes at our church. I'll develop it. I'll get a whole bunch of different women to give me a devotion. They hate me for it, but it will not hurt them because one of my callings in life is to push people out of their comfort zone so God can use them differently. It's a blessing and a curse. But anyway, it it's can be so- free. It can be free. And by the way, Jesus counted numbers when he told the disciples they had had a night of fishing in which they had caught nothing. And he said, throw your nets on the other side. And instead of arguing, they threw the nets on the other side. How many fish did they bring in? 153. Numbers matter. They matter to Jesus. They should matter to us. Okay. So here's the net. I think this is a great question. Uh, Hi, I'm new to ministry and started the women's ministry at a smaller church. How do I incorporate or start outreach evangelism? I think we really need to address this, even if it is a smaller church, a big church. A great question. It's a great question. And a lot of churches do not focus on um, outreach and evangelism. They focus on how do we keep the women that we already have? And it should be both and. But you keep the women that you already have when you're helping them see how their lives can have an impact for the kingdom. So a couple of different things that I would do, and then the, the girls will have other ideas. Um, one is the next event we have, we get everybody to come, we give them a ticket and it has a tear off and they get, a, and they're supposed to bring someone who's never been to our church before with them. So they get a ticket and then a, a BOGO, you know, even if the tickets are free, um, incentives, how many people are you bringing? How many people did you share this, this upcoming, whatever on Instagram, you know, or social media, do a giveaway, do some kind of recognition, um, be, Here's the deal. The world has tactics to promote what they want to promote. Use some of it for, for scriptural things, for biblical things, for church things, um, because people are already doing them. So those kind of things. Um, make sure that the language of everything that you do, pr- promotion, promoting, advertising-wise, um, speaks to the unchurched, okay? So don't promote an event about, you know, using, using biblical words that are sanctifications and justifications and, you know, all of these things, anointing, that kind of thing, because unchurched people don't know what that's, what that means. That sounds like a, it sounds like a club they're not a member of. So make sure that you're appealing to their perceived needs, you know, their perceived needs of, of, of loneliness and needing friends and connecting and parenting help and those kind of things. So make sure that the the way that we advertise lets them know that you don't have to be part of the club to come. We want you to come just as you are and those kind of things. So a lot of it has to do with your wording and then make your women, the 10 women that you already have involved, get them to each commit to bringing five women with them. All of a sudden you got a crowd. Mm Mm-hmm. That's so good. That's so good. Rachel, did you see on Jen Wilkins story last week? And I I just went and looked, she's got it saved on her Instagram. She said, um, want some help avoiding Christianese in your speech. And um, I actually wrote a book on it. Yeah. Yeah, It's so I have a Bible study called everything summed up. And it's a, it's everything I learned from my atheist neighbor about sharing your faith that I never learned in church. 
And my atheist neighbor used to say to me, do you want to know what we the people think? And I was like, we the people. She goes, we the people who don't go to church and don't listen to the Bible and don't all of those people and know what we think. And I thought, yes, I do. And I put a file on my computer called we the people. And every time Trish would tell me something, I would type it in because I grew up in church. So I think like a church person unapologetically. And so, but knowing you, you can't, you don't know how to reach them until you can understand a little bit more of how they're thinking. So I have a little book called everything summed up. It's on my website. Grab it if you want it. Yay. Good, good, good. Okay. We're going to go on to another question. Um, Cause I think this is where there's probably maybe our last one. How can we start changing the traditional ideas, aged speakers and get new ideas transitioning into our events I'm guessing into their women, into their women's ministry, Bible studies. Um, anybody want to tackle that? Just I would go back to what Rachel said, gather four or five women, different ages, different life stages, and ask that question, especially if they've been there a while. Um, and some of your, you know, even more mature ladies, Bible study, women's Bible study teachers, pastors, wives, just say, how can we be relevant to women? How can we uh, be create fresh and appealing I think the word appealing and attractive is real important uh, because the world is appealing and attractive, not in God's way. Um, So how can we be appealing and attractive to women in graphically how our communication looks, how our events look, um, how we format our events? Um, You know, I'm even thinking of some things I do. I'm tired of how they look. I want to do it different. Um, Ask your women. They will give you lots of good input. And then, you know, maybe you, you know, bring in special coffee. It's a coffee time or you coffee and muffins from a great muffin place or something, you know, just a little thank you to them. Um, And I write lots of thank you notes. It's totally, you know, just cost a stamp. Women really appreciate a handwritten thank you note. Yeah. One one thing that addresses that question and even the previous one is this. When we got to our church, it's a 165-year-old church and we came nine years ago. And it had a very 165-year-old church culture that wasn't, it's good. It's good. It, it, I was raised in it, but, and, and I would also say, always respect that which has gone before you, even if it, you, you kind of shifted a little going forward, always respect and honor that which has gone before you. But one thing I did was look around and realize we got a lot of women that are still coming to Bible studies and that's good. They're sitting in circles, but it, is it changing their lives? And so I just started a new Bible study called hands and feet. And all we do every Wednesday during Bible study time. Other people are sitting, other people are going to Bible study and there's nothing wrong with that. You should study the Bible, but we do hands and feet. And I got a whole group of women to just go out and do missions every Wednesday, somewhere in our community, we do a mission project every Wednesday and we get our hands dirty sometimes and we do some things, but do you know what has happened is we've all really began to realize that the church is not just inside these four walls, but it's out there in the community and we can have a huge impact and just a little thing. And by the way, Bible study still goes on. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're kind of ready to maybe try something different, try this. So you can do both and along the way and let things transition as they might naturally transition. So good. So good. Okay. I was going to end with one question, but I, I kind of want to tie it to one of the questions that came through. Um, Cause I was going to ask you all, you know, what's the best tip for your own spiritual growth um, as a leader. And one of the questions that also came through the uh, Q and a was what are some of the books and the podcasts that you listen to that you read? What, I mean, we are definitely, we are going to be women of the word and we are going to be in the scripture, whether that's a Bible reading plan or uh, however you set up your Bible, your time to really be in God's word. But what are just some other books and podcasts and or tips for personal spiritual growth? A um, couple of things that I have really been convicted of over the last year, I've shared with some of our trainer friends here on there is just confession. I think confession is sometimes an easy thing to gloss over or do from a really high level, like, Lord, you know, forgive me of my sins, my attitudes, whatever, but just, just sitting more in the actual sins I struggle with confessing them to God, you know, being willing to put myself out there and confess as scripture says to other sisters in Christ, you know, when appropriate. Um, I think it has just been something that has really enabled me to connect with the women that I'm serving as well, because it just levels the playing field a little bit. And so, you know, they come in and I'm not thinking I'm any better than they are. Um, And so, and it just always keeps your need when you, when you are 
taking the time to confess and um, repent of the things that you are continuing to struggle with, it just continually puts your need for Jesus before you. And the reality is all of our questions and answers could be summed up by just being attentive to where the Lord is calling us in those moments and letting the Holy Spirit guide us and he will give us everything we need. It's great to have these strategies and wisdom, but I think just keeping that, that connection vertically between uh, us and the Lord open and, you know, clear of our sin is a great place to start. We've got um, 30 seconds. (laughs) Really hard when you're, especially if you're on paid church staff or volunteer is your priority for worship, for corporate worship, uh, because it, it feels like a job every time you're at the building, at the church building, but really being in corporate worship with your church family, trying to turn the work brain off and focusing there, it's hard. Um, but that's, and with your family, you know, sitting with your family, with your children, if they worship with you, um, you know, you are, you know, first a believer and a part of that community. So I think that's important. Guard what you listen to, people. Make sure their theology is sound just because they tell a funny story about being a mom in the month of May and you resonate with that does not mean everything they say is good and true and lines up with scripture. So make sure that you are guarding your theology and what is coming into your head as far as what you're listening to. Those books, the Bible recap, Rediscovering Israel. Um, those kind of things can be really helpful. And I think a chronological read through at some point in your life is a big deal. That's great. That's great. We've loved being with everybody today. I want to thank our panelists um, for being with us today. Such an excellent uh, webinar today. And we, our next one will be in July. So we'll look forward to being online with all of you and thank you for being with us. um, And thank you for great questions and great conversation. Uh, We will see you next time. Bye Bye everybody. Thanks.